down a little bit, but that's okay. We had a good crowd last night. JW, I don't know where they heard I was singing or whether you. <laughs> <laughs> Might have been some of both, but, <laughs> but we're, we're grateful to those of you who are here. Good to have you out with us tonight. Um, we'll sing number 304, be our first song. John's already got it ready to go. <clears throat> This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest in the fall.
Let us pray, please. Our Father who art in heaven, we praise your great name this evening. Thank you so much, Father, for such a beautiful day, and thank you for every blessing that is bestowed upon us. Especially, Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made and he made on our behalf. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the church purchased with the blood of Christ. And we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to come together in this assembly tonight to be able to hear your word by Brother J.W. And we pray, Father, that the things he says will encourage all of us as we go by through our daily living. And Father, we're thankful that uh, we live in this country. We realize there are many difficult situations going on, not only here, but throughout the world. We pray, Heavenly Father, for peace, peace among men. And Father, we pray for those that are here tonight that uh, need to obey the gospel, for those, Father, who are outside of Christ tonight. We pray that something can be said or done to cause them to want to obey you. Oh, Father, we love you and we praise you. And Father, for all the good things that we have every day in our lives. And Father, we pray that you would continue to bless this congregation as they begin a new work with a new gospel preacher. We pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, whatever they do will be according to your will, that they, each one, will grow and, and they study your word together, that they may know what your will is for their lives. And Father, we pray uh, for this town. We pray, Heavenly Father, for this community and wherever your brethren are tonight. Now, Father, we pray for our brother, uh, John Kackelman, who's a missionary to Ukraine. He's in the Ukraine right now. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you'll uh, bless him and let him be safe as he plans more things for those people there. O oh Father, we know that you know what's best for us in our lives. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that each and every one of us would seek you first in our lives. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Three eighteen. <clears throat> I'll do all three verses. Although I cannot see the way for life's impetuous
be number 166. 166. If you'd like to stand, you may at this time. How shall I joke I was going to tell you, but since our crowd's improved, I won't do it. It was about a, about a young preacher, and it was, he just got him a new church, and it was his first, time, first sermon there, and uh, it snowed. And uh, he told his wife, his wife said, well, I'm not going, I'm not, you know, I've heard you preach this sermon all, for the last two weeks. He says, I've, I know everything you're going to say, so I'm just going to stay home. So he goes on over there, and there wasn't but one fellow in the building. Everybody else stayed home. And so he said, well, I guess me and you might as well go home. The fellow said, preacher, let me tell you something. He says, uh, so I'm a farmer. I raise cows. So I went out this morning to feed the cows. and said, there but one cow come up. So I didn't not feed that one because the other ones didn't show up. So I went ahead and I fed the cow. He said, well, I get your point. So I'll, I'll do my sermon. So he get up and he preached a sermon. He went on and on and on. Boy, he dotted every T, crossed every, dotted every I, crossed every T, didn't leave anything out. Finally, he gets through, about 45 minutes later, he gets through. And he asked the guy, I said, what'd you think about my sermon? He said, well, preacher, he says, like I said, I come down here to feed those cows. The only one showed up and said, I got a lot of feed in that barn, but I didn't give it all to that one cow. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully we can have something to say tonight. Uh, That'll be beneficial to us. We're talking about family. We're talking about my particular topic is really has to do with the, the mother and father, and especially the father. What a tremendous duty, responsibility, and privilege we have as parents in bringing children in the world and bringing those children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be very diligent in this, and we can't be too careful that we don't make sure we do it right. In Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, uh, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, for this is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou may live long on the earth. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now that's quoting out of the King James translation. Verse 4 of, of Ephesians 6, from the New American Standard and also the New King James, instead of says admonition, it says training. Bring up your children, training them in, in the way they should go. Training them in the way of the Lord. There's another passage in, in Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Train up a child in the way in which he should go, and even when he's old, he'll not depart from it. The book of Proverbs is, is, is a book of rules. It's not a book of laws. It's a book of rules uh, and recommendations. If we raise a child upright, 
then the possibility is he'll not depart from that. There's all exceptions to that, of course. We all know that. But the idea, and, 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 and you know, we all read the Bible, I hope we do. How shall the young secure their heart by taking heed thereto according to thy word? We just sung that beautiful song. Young people, if you're not students of the word, become students of the word. Take time each day to read the Bible. Not to just read, but to meditate on it, to think about what it's saying. It'll have more meaning to you. And sometimes we, we read, think, read passages over and over. And these two passages I've, I've, I've referred to tonight. But there's one word in there, and uh, like I say, in, in the King James is, is, is admonition, but in the in New American Standard and New King James is, is training. The training that goes into children, raising children. And I want to talk about that word. You know what it means training is? Some of you guys, and maybe some of you ladies for all I know, have been to boot camp, been in the military. But you know what they call boot camp? Basic training. You know, they, don't, they don't enlist you in the military and give you a rifle and say, don't you go out here and start shooting people. No. You have to be trained for that. We have Brother Larry Brady here. With, uh, he spent 70, 70 years in the Air Force, 30-something years in the Air Force. He did a lot with the Air Force, but he had to go through a lot of training before he got the position he had as a crew chief on the C-130s. It's all, always that way, no matter what your MOS, uh, military occupation especially, one, no matter what it is, they train you for that job, for that position. And sometimes it takes longer to train you because of the, the, the complications or whatever uh, of the position that you're putting you into. I was in the Marine Corps Aviation Ordnance, and we had like a 16-week school. We had to learn every bomb, every missile, every gun. That we owned any kind of aircraft, we had to learn all that stuff. And everyone had a modification. <laughs> we had to learn that. So it took all this time. And we get to the squadron, and I get to my squadron, and we don't have none of that stuff. And the one thing they told me we never would see, we had. So, but it was all training. And so I'm, I'm saying that to say this. There's more to raising children than just having them and letting them go. There's a, this idea of training. You have, in order to train somebody, you have to spend time with them. And I want to commend the church here at Laverne for the last leaders program. That's one of the greatest training programs that we have that I know of in the church. Excellent way to take these young boys and young girls and train them to be godly men and women when they grow up, to be leaders in the church, to be leaders in the community. That doesn't happen by accident. But it takes a lot from the parents, a lot of time to spend with those children. Talking about that, I want to tell you something. Brother Jack Zorn was, I had a lot of quotes from Brother Jack over the years. I spent a lot of time with him when I was in college. But I remember he said one time, he says, Take your boy fishing today, or you'll go hunting for him tomorrow. And the point he was trying to make had nothing to do with fishing, or hunting for that matter. The point is, spend time with your children. There's no substitute for that. Spend time with your children. A salesman rang a doorbell in a suburban home, and the door was opened by a nine-year-old boy puffing on a cigar. Well, the salesman was kind of... I was struck. He said, what's going on here? But, you know, he kind of got his composure back. And he asked, he says, little boy, is your mother at home? He took a big drag on that cigar, flipped ashes on the carpet. He says, what do you think, slick? <laughs> of course his mother wasn't home. He wouldn't be doing that if she was. Could it be that many of the problems with delinquent children can be traced back to the unavailability and irresponsibility of delinquent parents? I think so. I think that's one of the problems we have in our homes in America today. Hopefully not in the church. Absentee parents, delinquent children. Both scripture and social science say that uh, absent fathers and mothers is no new problem. It existed over 3,000 years ago. Solomon warned what would happen when children were not surrounded and supported by caring parents. Proverbs 29, verse 15, he said, The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but listen to this, 
A child left to himself brings shame to his mother. A child left to himself. What a terrible thought. Children left to themselves. But parents who are too distracted, too disconnected, too undisciplined, too self-absorbed in what's going on in their own lives to provide attention, affirmation, direction, discipline, and encouragement to their children, and nurture to their children, love and training to their children, a child left himself, a very haunting phrase. But there's more than one way to be absent from our children. Many teens in our day and age live in a private, adult-free world most of the time. They're occupied by websites, video games, spending 20% of their waking time alone. 20% of the time, they're totally alone. I'm reading most of this. Proverbs 20, 29, 15 speaks to the problem of problem children, problem parents who leave the children to themselves. Absent from the God-given task of bringing those children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. God expects us as parents to stay on the job, to keep on keeping on. Otherwise, it may be more than smoke or more than cigars that go up in smoke. We need to be careful where we're, where we're leading our children. There's a poem, y'all know I love poems, about Jesus' parable of the lost sheep. Now parents, don't you think about this. It's what was a sheep that went astray in the parable Jesus told. A full-grown sheep that strayed away from the 99 in the fold. Out on the hillside, out in the cold, t'was a sheep the good shepherd sought. And back to the flock, safe to the fold, t'was a sheep the good shepherd brought. So why with the, sh with the sheep should we earnestly plead? Why should we earnestly hope and pray? For there's danger if the sheep go wrong, they'll lead the lambs astray. For the lambs will follow the sheep, you know, where the sheep may stray. And if sheep go wrong, it won't be long till the lambs are as wrong as they. So with the sheep, we earnestly plead for the sake of the lambs today. For if the sheep are lost, what a terrible cost. Some of the lambs will have to pay. We need to train our children. We need to bring them up in the great nurture and admonition of the Lord. This, this training in the Lord. You know, Ephesians 6, 1 says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. That's assuming that they got godly parents is bringing them up in, in the right way, in the Lord. In the Lord's way, not just any old way. If you got godly parents, you need to get on your knees every night and thank God for that. Because a lot of us didn't have that growing up. We're talking about great fathers. We have examples throughout the Bible of great fathers. Uh, right off the bat, uh, I was going to say Jonah, but Noah. You know, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah walked with God. And in, and in Genesis chapter uh, 6 and verse 22, it says, Thus did Noah, according to all that the Lord commanded him, thus did he. He didn't veer to the left or to the right. He did what God told him to do. Abraham, another good example. In Genesis 12 and verse 4, God promised Abraham, says, Through thy seed shall all the nations of earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And for, well, he said, he didn't say that there, but he said that in Acts, Acts 22, 18. I mean, Genesis 22, 18. He says, And these shall all the nations of earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. We studied this some on Wednesday night. And, and the thing is, is that's repeated several times in the book of Genesis concerning Abraham. Well, he was a man who followed God, and he was blessed because of it, and he was, he was going to his future generation would be blessed. But let me say this, great men don't always make great fathers. We think of some of the greatest men in the Bible. Isaac, uh, Jacob, uh, even uh, David, Samuel, 
We look at Samuel as one of the great men of the Bible, but they weren't very good parents. They weren't the greatest parents in the world. They might have been pretty good. Uh, Isaac, his problem was he loved Esau more than he did, more than he did Jacob. And of course, Rebecca, Rebecca uh, Rachel rather loved Jacob more than him. So they had that problem going on. Anytime you show favoritism among your children, you're doing them a great disservice. What was the result of, uh, of that? Well, they didn't get along. They had, they had their split their ways. They finally reconciled 20 years later. Uh, Jacob, you know, he, did, he had the same problem. The Bible says that he, he loved Joseph more than all of his other children in Genesis 37 3. What was the result of that? Genesis 37 4, his brothers hated him. That and the dreams he was having, because his father had made him a coat of many colors. He showed his favoritism, just kind of like throwing it in the face of the other ones. And they didn't, res they, they resented that. So he was, he was a great man, but he wasn't, wasn't the best father in the world. Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, says the people, the, uh, pro he, 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 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 4, the people asked for a king because of Samuel's sons. Samuel had set them up as judges, but they were wicked, ungodly men. So they wanted a king. They didn't want these fellows leading them around. And David, of course, you remember what happened with uh, David's son, Absalom? He killed his own brother and fled. Gone for three years. Finally comes back and David did nothing. Winds up turning against David and tried to kill him. You heard the expression, like father, like son? Is that scriptural? Kind of, sort of. Actually, what the Bible says in Ezekiel 66, 44, as is the mother... So is the daughter. Now what Ezekiel is talking about, he's talking about God is about to bring, bring doom and destruction on Jerusalem. He's, Ezekiel's already been carried away. He's in Babylon. But he's talking about how the women had behaved in ungodly ways, and God had already taken a bunch of them away. But he's about to go back and get the rest of them and destroy the city and the temple. He says, like mother, like daughter. So we, we, we redo it, rephrase it a little bit, so like follow the same thing. The apple don't fall from the tree, the old saying we use here. It's hard to rise above the example that's set for you. For example, the kingdom of Israel divided, you know. Northern kingdom had 10 tribes, southern kingdom had two. Northern kingdom had 19 kings, started out with, with Jeroboam. Every single one was wicked. And there's 19 times it's mentioned in the Old Covenant, through uh, First and Second Kings, or Second Kings, it's mentioned in there, that 19 different times he says, each one of those kings, he says, he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin and caused Israel to sin. So he set the pattern for the rest of them. His children followed right in his footsteps. All the other kings followed right in his footsteps. As fathers, we have a special calling, a special mission, if you please, a, 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 a special purpose to bring children up and, and, and to be faithful children of God. That takes training. That takes work. That takes time. takes dedication. Someone once said, uh, let's see, I done wrote it down here. Yeah. Parents may tell but not teach until they practice what they preach. How do we communicate with our children? You, you hear the story, but well, I just can't communicate with my child. I can't communicate with my son. I can't communicate with my daughter. No, you communicate. We always communicate. There's two ways that we communicate with our children as well as everybody else. That's verbally and non-verbally. Verbally, of course, is like what I'm doing now. I'm trying to encourage you as parents to be good parents, to be better parents. But how do I do that in my daily walk? I live it. Okay, let me ask you a question. If children are exposed to parents, you know the old saying, do like I do, don't, don't do like I do, do like I tell you. But the idea is, uh, we're talking about verbal and nonverbal communication. Which one do you think they listen to the most? What you say or what you do? You know the answer to that as well as I do. And that brings us to another poem, one of my favorite 
Edgar Guest, he had a poem called Sermons We See. Sermons We See. He said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely point the way. The eyes of better people, more willing than the ear. Fine counsel can be confusing, but example is always clear. The best of all the preachers are those who live their creed. To see the, uh, for those who live their creed, for to see good in actions, what everybody needs. He said, I might misunderstand the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. He said, the sermons you deliver, or the lectures you deliver, may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lesson by observing what you do. But you can't misunderstand the way we act and the way we live. So we need to be good examples, good influences on our children. Let's see what time we got here. Oh, we got plenty of time. I wanted, I wanted to read something to you. This is a song that I ran across. I heard it years ago when I was a young man. I don't know when it was recorded. A fellow named Cat Stevens, a song called The Cat's in the Cradle. Y'all, people nodding their head, they feel me with that. It says, a child had just arrived the other day. He came to the world the usual way. But there were plans, planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. He was talking before I knew it, and as he grew, he said, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. Children do that, don't they? Daughters want to be like their mamas. Little boys want to be like their daddies. Okay, let me find it here. Okay, he said, the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy, and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't, know, I don't know when, but we'll get together then. We'll have a good time then. My son, my son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me how to throw? I said, not today. I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. I'm going to mess this thing up. Going the wrong way, J.W. I ain't no good at all this. But as he walked away, but his smile never dimmed, he said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be like him. Cats in the cradle, that's a little chorus. Silver spoon, little boy grew, and the man in the moon grew. Little boy and the man in the moon. When you come, Dad, don't know soon, don't know when, but we'll get there then, we'll know we'll have a good time then. He came from college just the other day, so much like a man, I just had to say, Son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and said with a smile, What I really like, Dad, is to, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? Catching the cradle of silver spoon goes on with that again. I've long since retired. My son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I can find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle, and the kids have the flu. But it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. Sure nice talking to you. As he hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. That's a song, I know, entertainment stuff, but it has so much meaning to it. That's, that's one of our problems with our society today. Not enough time spent with our children. In, in, in dry, directing them in the way in which they should go. Fathers, mothers, where? Where are we leading our children? They're going to follow us. Children naturally admire and imitate adults that nurture them. It's just a natural thing. It's just the way it is. Godly parents should be value builders in their children. They should be teaching and training and nurturing, developing in them a system of values. 
society calls this socialization. Build up a system of values. Values are the beliefs to which one attaches worth. You know, some people say, well, they don't have a very good value system. And the supreme values is beliefs to which we attach supreme value. The things that are most important to us. Very, very, very important to us. And, and for one, of the, one of the things that we need to understand is we're talking about leading by example. And as, as far as the church is concerned, I read this thing not long ago. It says, it's hard to convince your children. Uh, if you're not the primary, if, if church is not the primary importance in your life, you think it's going to be in your children? No. It's hard to convince your children that the church is the most important thing in the world when you neglect about when you're negligent about attending its services and supporting its work. It's hard to convince your children that the church is the greatest institution in the world when you permit them to miss services to go elsewhere. That hits all my no. It's hard to convince your children that the church is, is, is to be held higher than anything when, they, when you insist that they do their homework for public school but neglect their Bible studies. We've majored in minors, minored in majors. Got the cart before the horse on some of the stuff. It's hard to convince your children when you don't even try to convince them of much of anything. Just let them do their own thing. That's disaster. When we're talking about socialization. We're talking about children uh, creating values being created in children. This is created by values are created. We're talking about uh, beliefs. Values are beliefs of which we attach worth. Supreme values, beliefs to which we attach great worth or supreme worth. Uh, this is developed in children a couple of ways, by exposure and experience. What are our children exposed to more than anything else? You know, always, it's always fascinated me that we send our children to public school or private school or some kind of school five days a week. But how much time do we actually have spend with them in, in, in Bible study? Okay, what do we do? Why do we do that? Well, I know they got laws, you got to go to school. But why do we do that? Why do we want to educate our children so? For their future, right? We don't want to be bums. We want them to have a, be able to work, provide for themselves, provide for their families, be uh, good citizens. So we send them to school. We teach them how to do these things. They're trained 12 years of school. Some of them going to four years of college and others more than that. To train them for what? To how to live in this present society. Okay? But there's a little bit of something more important than that. Jesus talks about in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive it on myself. Jesus is going to prepare a place for you. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, where the great judgment scene, where Jesus got, you know, he says, King, kingdom of heaven like shall be like unto, uh, you know, these, all these things, the sheep, the shepherd dividing the sheep from the goats. Sheep on the right hand, goats on the left. He's going to say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father. What? Inherit the kingdom. What? Prepared for you from the foundations of the world. There's a place prepared for us. God has it prepared. Jesus has it prepared. But you go on down in Matthew 25 to get toward the end of it. Uh, I think it's about verse 46, I mean 43, somewhere along there. Um, Depart from me, you curse it into everlasting fire. Those were those on his left hand. Everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
So we're preparing ourselves for something. We're preparing our children for something. What? That's what we need to think about. What are their values? Who determines the values of our children? Do we do that for them? Or do, we, do we get them socialized to, to, to be godly men and women when they grow up? Or are we letting somebody else do it? We talked about 20% of the time they're alone, they're on, they're on, they're on the phone, they're, they're texting, they're, I don't know what they do on these phones or tablets or whatever they got. But I guarantee you, most of them ain't Bible studying on it. They're doing other things. Things is maybe all right. It may be counterproductive. We need to know. We need to find out. We need to make sure. Um, but they're exposed to movie stars. They're exposed to athletes. They're exposed, exposed to singers, performers of all kinds. If we let these people determine for them what their values are, you can imagine what kind of values they're going to have. They're going to be just like these people. You ever heard of a fellow named Norman Lear? I know you've heard me talk about him. Norman Lear came on the scene back in the 70s. He was a Hollywood producer. You know something like 62% of Hollywood producers are atheists? He's an atheist. He came up with a statement that says, people will accept new ideas and new concepts if it's presented to them through humor. Look at your situation comedies. This was in the 70s, 80s. Look at where they are now. Things that's going on on these situation comedies were never even dreamed of 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Now it's common. And people have accepted that because we've allowed that exposure to become our experience and it socialized us to becoming more like the world like Jesus Christ. We spend too much time preparing for the here and now, not enough for the hereafter. That's what's important, the hereafter. And the very serious duty, responsibility, and privilege that we have as parents to do that for our children. Make sure we got them going in the right direction. They may, they may turn and go the other way eventually. We don't know that. But we give them the background. We give them the foundation that's what uh, Proverbs 22.6 uh, is talking about. Train up a child in the way in which he used to go. When he's old, he's not depart from it. I've known people, you have to, brought up in the church, left the church. But they come back. Sometimes they don't come back. But a lot of times they do. Because they, they reflect. They remember that training. They remember that background that they have from mom and daddy. And they know that's right. You hear people say, I don't go to church. Mom and daddy made me go to church when I was growing up. You know how you answer that? What else did your mom and daddy make you do? Did they make you take a bath? Do you still take a bath? So we use church and God and spiritual things like we wouldn't do anything else. The bottom line is they don't want to go to church. They don't want to know about God. They don't want to know about what's right and what's wrong. They're, they've, got their, they've got their values. And they, that's, what, that's all they want. And they think that's good enough. They bought into this idea that, you know, I'm not a murderer, I'm not a rapist, I'm not a thief. I'm a pretty good fella, pretty good lady, pretty good whatever. So I'm good to go. No. They won't get it. We have to be Godly. We had to put th first things first. We had to put God first. And we had to instill this in our children to be that same way. But they're not going to be that way if, first of all, if we don't train them, and secondly, uh, secondly, if they don't see it in us. So where are you leading your children, parents? Think about it. It's not too late to change, you know, if you're not, going in, if you're not leading them in the right direction. There's, there's plenty of opportunity right now to change. If you need to do that, what's holding you back? Maybe you hadn't been the best parent in the world. And maybe it's between you and your children. You need to tell them, look, I, you know, I'm sorry. I might not have been there like I ought to. I'm, I'm going to do better. 
Get that worked out. Get that straightened out. What kind of a child have you been for God? You know? If you are a child of God, are you, are you, are you faithful? Are you doing the things that God would have you to do? As a parent, bringing those children up the best way you know how. Nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and training of the Lord. God expects us to train our children to do what's right. To walk in the light as, as Jesus is in that life. 1 John 1, 7 through 9. So where are we tonight? If we talk about home, we talk about family, and this really breaks, that's where the rubber hits the road is the parents and the children. Because whatever happens to them is going to depend on a lot of what, what a lot is going to depend on what we do with them now. That's why I like the Last of Leaders program so much. It gives parents an avenue to, to work with those children and to teach them Christian values, leadership values, how to be godly men and women when they grow up. We set them up here on the front row. We don't do it so much now. Pew Packers, we call it. I didn't ever like that name. But, but anyway, they, knew, they would go through this little drill with them and always ask them, what are you going to be when you grow up? You remember that? And what was they shout out? I want to be a Christian. I hope they keep that. And they will. If we keep pushing it. We're going to have to keep pushing it. We're going to have to keep encouraging, building them up. Bringing them up and nurturing that mission, Lord. It might be that you're here tonight you never obeyed the gospel. We don't want to leave here without giving you that opportunity. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you're willing to turn away from sin, confess faith in Jesus, and to be baptized in water for remission of sins, you can be added to God's family. That's what it's all about. God's family. That's the greatest family on earth. I mean, the physical families are great, wonderful. God bless us. We, we couldn't get by, can't get by without them. But then there's another family that's, that's even more special, more precious. That's God's family, the family that's going to live on in heaven throughout eternity. You know, one of the worst things I could think about would be to die and be lost and be right there beside my children because I didn't teach them, because I didn't develop them along the way. If you're here tonight and you need to obey the gospel, won't you? or you need to be restored, you've got things in your life you need, you need for the church to pray for you, we'd be glad to do that. So come on forward as together we sing this song.
in here tomorrow at 11 o'clock, so if you don't mind cleaning up those squad one more time. Don't forget, uh, Brother Joe, you know, who passed away at this funeral was Monday. Uh, continue to keep that family in prayers as well. Next week is a meeting in uh, Rock Hill. There's actually a meeting in Mount Island. And the following week is a meeting in Walnut Street, Green. So you got plenty to do. Ladies, I want to say thank you for what y'all have done this week. I don't want to ask you to feed us again for the next six months. I think we'll be okay. All right, so y'all y'all about to work yourself this week. And thank you for that. Uh, come tomorrow night. Maybe you'll get something out of something tomorrow night. But uh, we appreciate you being here tonight. Did I miss anything? No? Um, I think I'm going to sing one more song and then uh, we'll close with prayer. 711. We'll do the first verse. And Brother Walter will lead us in our closing prayer. We'll be back tomorrow night at 7 o'clock p.m. My God and I go in the fields together. We walk and talk as good friends should and do. We clasp our hands, our voices ring with laughter. My God and I walk through the Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful evening that you've given us to, to us tonight and the opportunity to come and hear another wonderful lesson. Please be with us as we leave this building and remember what JW put in front of us to take to heart, to be able to raise up the children in the way that you would have us to raise them. Father, it's also our responsibility in other avenues and opportunities that you give to all of us whether we have children or not to also go out there in the community to grow this family and to also give us the opportunity to teach other people in the direction they need to go and bring them to you father at this time i would also like to preempt tomorrow evening service and to be with brother stay and to know that he will pre pre present a lesson that will be gladly accepted by people that are here and the commitment that I see personally from this group of people here dedicated to the work going forward is a wonderful opportunity. Father, be with us as we leave this evening to go on our separate ways and to please bring us back tomorrow evening to, to enjoy another wonderful lesson. And all these things we come to you through in Jesus Christ, our holy name. Amen.